All right. Um, so I am Rebecca Pisano. I am an Education USA Program Officer for Higher Education Engagement at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. And joining us a little bit later in the presentation will be my colleague, Robin Lathrop. And she is the same title. Um, she's a Education USA Program Officer for Higher Education Engagement, and we're both at the State Department. Next slide. Okay, so the agenda today, just really quickly, uh, we'll give a very brief intro to EdUSA. I know many of you are quite familiar. Um, and then we're gonna dive into the seminar, the seminar hosting itself. Uh, so some of the basics, the benefits, we'll talk a little bit about the application and some tips. And I'm excited that we'll have a couple guest speakers who have hosted themselves to uh, talk to you and answer your questions. So it should be hopefully an engaging and informative discussion. Next slide. So really quick, uh, what is Education USA? We are a network, we promote US higher education. We have two main constituencies, uh, foremost prospective international students around the world. We, we um, engage them and try to get them to come to the United States and find their best fit uh, institution academically, financially, as well as socially. And our second main constituent is you all, the US higher education community. We work with the over 4,000 accredited colleges and universities in the US higher education system. And we do this through our global network of over 400 Education USA International Student Advising Centers in more than 175 countries and territories around the world. We're committed to promoting all institutions equally. And most of our services and our basic services are free, um, both to prospective students and to US institutions. OK, next slide. So starting on the basics of the seminar, what is the purpose? So these seminars started out in 2019, and the goal was to connect the higher education community, facilitate discussions, share best practices on international student recruitment, enrollment, and support services. And we did that um, by having a variety of sessions, and the presenters included US Department of State officials, Education USA Regional Educational Advising Coordinators, or REACTS, we usually have two of them at each seminar. We have representatives from higher education associations, we have college and university leaders. Sometimes we have representatives from our colleagues at the US Department of Commerce and other experts in the field. And it does vary by seminar. So um, there are some themes that are consistent, but we each one is a unique event in terms of content. Um, the audience is meant to be, and, and of course, when we started this in 2019, it was in person, um, the audience was meant to pull a diverse group of higher education professionals from the immediate geographic area, so the surrounding um, location, even surrounding states, um, and have a variety of types of institutions and a variety of institutions that have are in different places in terms of um, their international student numbers and even you know what administratively what their office looks like in terms of um, staff support and resources etc and we're really interested in targeting those institutions that maybe are just getting started or we're really um, to connect between those who are more experienced with those that are just beginning with international student recruitment and these events uh, the seminar is always free of charge for those attending um, we do have two primary tracks for the content. Um, we, we do focus on enhancing and expanding Education USA outreach, as well as facilitating international student campus integration. Um, but there's a variety of other content that can also be included. And as I mentioned, it varies by the actual seminar. The content and the uh, session topics are determined in collaboration with the host campus or organization and Education USA and on our um, website, and I'm going to put it in the chat here. Um, we do provide past uh, web pages that our past hosts have kindly put together as reference. So it doesn't, you know, that they, they each look a little differently, um, but just to give you more of an idea of what it can look like, and you don't need to have that level of um, determination by any means uh, at the time of application. It's just for your reference. Um, and as far as the format, uh, like I said, we started in person. We've done 
uh, two in person. And this year we've done two virtual <laughs> because like everyone else we've had to. And so they're both possibilities moving forward and they have always been one day with the rationale being um, that people can come from nearby, not spend money on hotel or much money on travel. It's a free event. And um, for even for the, the virtual seminars, people can pop in and out to sessions as they desire. Um, so that's, um, that's the, the start of our basics. I have a little bit more on the next slide, please. Okay, some eligibility. So any accredited US higher education institution, association, a university system consortia, or nonprofit 501c3 organization are eligible to apply to host an Education USA seminar. And we have some general responsibilities that we ask of our host. And I'm going to post here the link to the actual application, which is also linked from our website. Um, I'm sure many of you have looked at it previously, but I wanted to um, put that out there now because uh, we do have a list of responsibilities at the very end of that form, and it's kind of a, a meaty list. So um, I just really quickly, though, logistics is the main responsibility, whether that's uh, reserving in-person rooms or conference space or arranging for an online platform. Um, communication is a big piece. Uh, you would engage in regular planning conversations with Education USA, and I'll talk about more about timeline in a little bit. Um, a web page to have the seminar information, a mechanism to register attendees. Uh, publicizing the event is also something that's important. And that is done in conjunction with us and with the host. The more we can get the information out there to get people to attend, the, the better the, the um, event is going to be. And we also work together to identify and recruit presenters. The host is responsible for sending an evaluation following the event, and we do have a template for that. So you don't have to come up with the content, but you do need a mechanism electronically uh, to collect responses. And then if it's in person, it's optional, but you may wanna think about um, providing like, uh, it doesn't even have to be a whole meal, but like a coffee break or something like that. And some, campuses have gotten sponsors for that. So we can talk more about, late, about that later if there's more questions. You certainly don't have to have that figured out for the application. Um, so general costs, I would say, um, and of course these are gonna vary or look a little different, whether it's in-person or virtual, would be for things like, I know on some campuses, even uh, reserving rooms has a fee associated. Um, tech perhaps, if it's not, not already in place uh, at your organization or your institution, um, any logistical support, like tech support, may or may not, uh, you know, it's going to look a little bit differently if there's a fee or what that entails, depending on the host. Um, and then registration promotion, um, those are some uh, things to consider about the cost. Okay, next slide. So benefits of hosting, why would you want to host an Education USA seminar? Well, I think there's lots of great reasons, and a couple that I want to share is that um, it's it's a great opportunity to gain exposure, name recognition for your institution regionally, but even nationally. Uh, we have, um, even though the, the in-person seminars, are, like I said, are meant to draw from the surrounding area, it's not to say that, you know, others are not going to join from elsewhere, especially our presenters may come from um, all over the country, potentially. And of course, if it's virtual, we get the whole gamut. We get people from across the country joining. So that can be uh, really great for your institutional organization to have that, um, have that publicity. Uh, it's an opportunity to connect with local colleagues, existing as well as potentially connect you with new colleagues. And that could lead to other collaboration opportunities down the road. It's always great in our field to share best practices to enhance our own work and contribute to professional development and the events and opportunity to network and collaborate with other higher education experts and connect with leaders in the field, uh, such as association leaders and, and um, experts from international education organizations. 
But I think the benefits are, of hosting are also really best articulated by past hosts and the hosts themselves. So I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to introduce, we have two guests today. Um, and so first of all, I'll introduce Stacy Thompson. Do you wanna just wave your hand, Stacy? Okay. She is the executive director of the Study Alabama Consortium for Global Engagement and Economic Development. And Stacy was part of a team that hosted an in-person seminar in September of 2019. Um, and we also have with us today, Brian Stelbotsky. Hi, Brian, he's waving his hand. He is the Director of International Admissions at Boise State University in Idaho. And he was our first, uh, or his institution and his team were the first that we worked with to host a virtual event. And that seminar happened in May of this year. So we have some diverse experiences and perspectives here. So I'm gonna start with you, Stacy. Can you tell us what motivated uh, Study Alabama and your collaborators to host the seminar? And what did you feel was the, the best benefit that came out of hosting? So, so at the time that we did this event, um, I was, the secretary for study Alabama and my real job every day I work at Jefferson State Community College I'm an immigration advisor here and honestly that was a great deal of the part that um, led to the interest in this was trying to create accessibility for learning more about recruitment for underserved institutions that was part of it so a lot of we had 71 people participate including people that came from Education USA, we had the REACTS, we had uh, the, you know, the different agency representatives that came. We had about um, 37 schools that participated. And I would say more than half were either HBCUs, community colleges, or small liberal arts schools. So, you know, the schools that have a ton of experience in international recruitment, they know a lot of this stuff, but there's, those of us that don't get on an airplane and go international recruiting every day, trying to figure out ways to do it with resource um, limits, that was kind of what was the beginning of the impetus for this, because um, I was part of those conversations. But it was also that we were a very young organization, Study Alabama only in became um, in existence in 2016. So uh, it was this was like our first big hurrah as an organization to try to, you know, do something consistent for the whole state. I mean, it wasn't just Alabama schools that attended by and large. We had Tennessee, Georgia, a couple from Florida. I even had somebody, I think, from the like West Coast that came. So, you know, it's not limited to anybody. It's open to anybody. And that's part of the beauty of it um, is that it is open and accessible to anybody. So that was our reasoning. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, Stacy. And now I'd like to pose the same to you, Brian. What motivated Boise State to host and what do you feel was the greatest benefit of doing so? Yeah, um, thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. I see a couple of familiar names and faces. It's nice to see everybody here. Um, so Boise State University, uh, we first saw the call for hosts and started having those discussions uh, amongst our, uh, the International Admissions Office here as part of uh, a Center for Global Education that comprises several different offices. Uh, and we thought that it would be a really interesting way to try to highlight um, a region of the country that I think is often under highlighted uh, when we're talking about international students um, or international mobility. Uh, you know, the Mountain West uh, has a lot of great schools in it, uh, but uh, compared to the coast, uh, you know, is not the largest host of international students. But there are some really uh, big benefits, I think, to being here as a student. So it actually grew out of uh, that conversation where we wanted to highlight our region, our institution, uh, and find ways to kind of get that out there. Um, Education USA is a big part of our recruitment strategy in general. Uh, we are not an office that has a massive budget and we are small in terms of staff. And so uh, we really rely on a lot of the things that Education USA is able to offer us. Uh, so the opportunity to get Boise State's name out there um, in the Education USA network, we are always looking for opportunities to do that. Uh, and so this was a great way to do it. 
Uh, and for us in particular, I think hosting it virtually was a really great opportunity. Um, Boise is uh, far from many places. Uh, and so it was, it was nice to be able to gather colleagues from really all across the country. I think we ended up with something like 45 states represented um, at our virtual event. And so it was a really wide array of experiences, um, which was great to connect with people from all over the country. So uh, to sum all of that up, I would say kind of twofold, right? One, uh, the benefit for the institution for me was getting our name out there to Education USA. Um, we did uh, even hear from advisors uh, around the world who were not in attendance at the session, who reached out to us afterwards and said, you know, I saw you were the host for the seminar. Uh, that's fantastic. And so those connections were, were built or maintained. Um, and then the other benefit, of course, uh, is that professional development. So just being able to connect with colleagues, being able to provide another opportunity for that professional development and have a hand in uh, building the content and deciding how that shaped, um, I really appreciated that for Boise State, particularly at a time when uh, things have been so challenging. And there were some conversations that I thought uh, were timely and were important. And I was really grateful for the opportunity to be able to put those out there uh, as uh, on behalf of Boise State. Wonderful. If, if I may echo that really quick, um, you know, Study Alabama, as I said, was an unknown. And after this, we've done, it put, it put our state and our consortium in front of the REACTs and in front of EDUSA. And we've done several partnerships with regional REACTs as Study Alabama. So it's been, it has been very good for exposure for our institutional members uh, for the consortium. So I have to echo that. Um, you go. Great, thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Brian. That's, that's really wonderful to hear, of course. That's exactly what we want to happen. So we appreciate your sharing um, and uh, grateful that you could join us today to share those different perspectives that you both have. Okay, so I'm gonna get back to the application uh, talk a little bit about the components of it. Uh, you have that link previously if you uh, in the chat if you want to reference it. It's really actually brief. It's, it's, there's not that much to it, but there are some things you do need to think through before filling it out. Um, one part is about your preferences. So this is both uh, format and time frame. So by format, uh, we mean, would you prefer to host an in-person event? Would you prefer to host a virtual event? Are you open to doing either? Those are really important things for us to know, especially now when uh, we might start off one way and end up another way. But uh, if you're at all open to both, I encourage you to select that option. Um, and uh, if you're not, that's fine too. Um, it's just a chance for you to communicate that to us and institutions and organizations have, have different reasons for what their preferences might be. And then time frame, we've split it into seasons. So uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, we do intend to have more seminars in the future per year than we have been doing. And certainly than we've been doing during uh, the pandemic, uh, but we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. And so just knowing if there's certain times of the year that are uh, more convenient or others that are totally out for you, you can check as, as many as you like. That's helpful for us to know too. And then the actual time is, is discussed in conversation between us and the host. Um, it's important to think about what facilities your institution or campus organization might have, whether that's physical facilities to have a meeting or the platform that will host the meeting, and to think about what that capacity might be. Um, and I think time frame comes into that um, that thinking as well. And then the publicity plan is very important. So to think through what methods might be feasible for you to promote the event. We do list in the application some options that you can check, but it's not an exhaustive list. So if you have other more innovative or um, maybe unique ideas, please do add them. We'd love to see that. As far as the registration process, you don't need to provide details for the application but I do urge you to consider the ability to do so. Um, and there's no one way that works best. Oftentimes uh, institutions will already have uh, a software or some 
some tool in place that they um, can use because I know you you all do events often and you probably have to register students for things and so um, we're not looking for one particular thing but we do want to know that you've thought about it and have the um, you know have the capacity to do that and then I mentioned earlier the host responsibilities um, and at the bottom is just an agreement to that we really just want uh, institutions or organizations to make a commitment to follow through if they're selected. So um, all the things I mentioned earlier, logis logistics, communications, publicity, session facilitation, all that would come into play. And then just a couple words on the review process. So once the, the deadline passes, uh, we do an internal review uh, at, at ECA, Educational and Cultural Affairs, uh, where um, myself and Robin are based. And we're really looking for an application that's well thought out, um, I mean, we're, we're always open to creative ideas, although um, admittedly, there's not much space for uh, much content. I mean, the application is really straightforward, but but again, just, just evidence that it's been thought through, everything's answered or filled out, everything's clear. Um, you won't need to put any detail on session content or anything like that, as I said. Um, but it's always great to see diversity in terms of uh, collaboration, who you might work with, and ability to outreach for publicity or ex, um, expand our outreach uh, to uh, to reach institutions uh, perhaps that we haven't before and just the whole feasibility of, of what it looks like for you to host. Um, we may come back to some applicants to ask for more information or with some questions before making selections, uh, but keep in mind not all applicants want the same format or time frame. So, um, and we're looking for multiple hosts, as I said, for 2022. Um, I don't have an exact number, but um, you know we're really we're really excited that you're interested and encourage you to uh, complete the application if if you're at all thinking that it might be something that you can do. And and just a reminder on some important dates: the deadline for the application to host in 2022 is November 15th. So we will close that um, the end of the day. Um, well, quite honestly, it'll probably be the next morning Eastern time. Um, but it's not like it closes that day at a specific time. And then we intend to review and hopefully reach out to applicants um, by early to mid-December. Um, that's our plan. And you would be contacted regardless of the outcome of the decision. So we'll, you'll definitely hear back from us. And then in our experience, it takes at least two or three months to plan and put together an event. And so at that time, those hosts that are selected for 2022, we'd reach out and start thinking about the plan and the, the, um, the time frame, and then go from there. Um, and you know, it starts off with conversations, but as you can imagine, things then ramp up quickly as we get closer to the event date. Okay, next page, please, or next slide. <laughs> and then just some application tips. Um, we haven't always had co-hosts. Um, Study Alabama did co-host, uh, worked with a local institution um, where the event actually took place. Um, Boise State did it um, on their own in terms of from their end, but we do, I mean, you don't have to have a co-host, but it is helpful and we do encourage it just because we like to see different types of institutions and organizations working together. Um, we like to see diversity, for example, of maybe community college with, with four-year colleges, MSIs, diversity of types of international student populations or number of international students. Um, usually, as I said, for in-person, there's a specific geographic location focus, um, not as relevant, uh, but can still be for virtual. And, you know, we just ask that that coordination and discussion happens before an uh, hosting applications submitted, and we would like to see you know, one application uh, for co-hosts submitted together. Um, so again, just consider your process, think through registration, publicity, et cetera, before submitting. I mentioned that we have sample agendas from past events, uh, the link posted on the website. Um, and I also just, you know, more than ever, <laughs> we all need some flexibility, I think. It's appreciated and 
definitely needed. And because we're still in the midst of this pandemic, um, you know, our goal is to get back to in-person seminars, but we honestly don't know what that's going to look like for 2022. So, you know, if you're selected for in-person and then we need to pivot to virtual, um, we know that you're putting those preferences in the application, but we may not have all the answers up front. And so, you know, we're all having to be just uh, see how things go as they come. So uh, we're still we're still in that mode. Um, but I do want to reiterate, don't hesitate to reach out to us, to myself or to Robin. And please contact us with questions. Um, actually, Brian at Boise State reached out to us in advance to request a meeting. He had some questions about the application and we just talked through it in general. And that I think that was, I mean, I thought it was helpful and hopefully he did too. And he still did submit an application. So that was, that was good news. Um, and I'd really like to invite Brian and Stacy to give some, some more advice here, if they have any advice on, um, you know, in terms of just hosting in general, uh, what maybe what you wish you had known before or something that you found helpful, if you have anything to add, that is. Um, and if not, we can go on to the, the Q&A. So I just want to check in with you. Um, I, I actually put something in the chat because ours was a physical session uh, with, with this program. I would definitely say collaboration is key. <laughs> if you're going to do the physical one, just because of the logistics of hosting that many people in a physical space, some of the things that we needed to make sure of is we had adequate meeting rooms, that we had adequate, like larger space, because we ended up with, you know, 70 people. We were lucky enough to be hosted by Alabama State University, which is an HBCU, and they donated the facility space to us. Um, we were also able to get um, collaborative sponsorship from our Alabama Department, um, Alabama Trade Commission. Uh, they sponsored some of the breaks and um, coffee hours that we had. So, you know, so collaboration with your state agencies, collaborations with, um, you know, other partners within the states are really valuable. So that, that'd be my take on that. Thank you for that. Brian, did you want to add anything? I will, um, thank you. Uh, so I would say probably my biggest application tip is to, uh, kind of echoing a little bit what Stacy said, to think carefully about the coordination in advance, even if it's virtual. Um, I thought that a virtual event was very doable as a single institution, but there, of course, was a lot of collaboration across campus uh, with tech support and different partners that we were asking to come and deliver sessions. Uh, and one of the things that surprised me the day of the event or, or leading up to it as we looked at the registration list was the uh, diversity of roles represented on different campuses. So we, of course, had a lot of international admissions, international recruitment uh, type uh, professionals joining us. But we also had people from International Student Services Office. We had some faculty members. We had uh, these uh, housing offices, I think, these different areas around campus who uh, somehow got to the registration and decided to join us, which was excellent, I thought. Um, had I known that uh, further up front, I may have reached out more broadly to campus partners uh, to encourage some of that insight in our sessions as well. Uh, so to try to plan sessions maybe that uh, spoke to those different roles that might be interesting uh, coming at it from sort of a holistic international recruitment or international student experience or integration sort of perspective. Uh, so I would encourage you to just Talk to your campus partners, uh, think carefully about coordination and staff resources and uh, the time involved uh, to really maximize what is possible. By the time I realized that that might be something fruitful, we were we were pretty late in the game and it was hard to reach out to uh, campus partners and, and request their participation at that point. So um, I, think, I think that would be my tip going into it. And I will also say, Rebecca, you mentioned our, our phone call in advance. That was extremely helpful for me as we went through the application. And I think if I recall, I, I more or less pitched our application idea to you uh, <laughs> to get uh, a little bit of feedback. And you certainly didn't say um, you know, yes or no, but just sort of uh, confirmed that we were headed in a direction that uh, aligned maybe with uh, what you might be thinking about. So that was really helpful to get some of that clarity 
in advance. Excellent. Thank you to you both. I mean, those are those are great tips and hopefully helpful to um, the others on the call as well. Um, I want to turn to Q&A now. We have about uh, 10 minutes or so, and I just really briefly want to hit, um, we had asked in the registration for this event for people to submit questions in advance. So I want to make sure that we get to those that were relevant to the seminar. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to go through those and then I'll take from the chat. Um, so the first question is, how many people from Education USA are likely to attend? And are there travel and lodging costs covered? Um, so whether it's virtual or in person, um, in terms of attending and, and participating, we have um, usually two people from ECA and we have two REACs. Um, and you're not responsible for, for any of our travel or anything like that. Um, the only cost would be what's associated with putting on the event itself. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have, may have other people that, if it's virtual, that, that listen in. Um, but as far as the, act, the active collaborators, there will be two reacts and, and two program officers, uh, more than likely. Um, next question, is there financial support available to provide food? Um, we do not have any financial uh, support for this event per se, but as Stacy mentioned, um, you, know, you can seek sponsors for food. There's no obligation to provide food for an in-person event. Um, I think the important thing is making sure attendees are aware up front, just what is being offered and what isn't being offered. And um, you, you, know, you could either uh, maybe go to uh, you know, a, a food place where there's multiple options or give people time to go, you know, depending on the setup and how far away they are from things. Um, or others you know, have just done a coffee break or something, but, but there's nothing required by any means. And every situation is gonna look a little different. Two more quick questions here. What does the framework look like if it's virtual? Would it be on something like Zoom or hosted on a social media platform? Um, so again, we, we are looking for a platform that can, um, can, can accommodate the event. It, we're open to different ideas and how that happens. Um, we've had two virtual seminars to date. They've both been on Zoom um, and that's just what the host proposed because it's a common <laughs> platform that many institutions already have a license for and are using. Um, but, you know, we're open to whatever works. Um, so, you know, again, it, I think oftentimes it's just a matter of what the, the institutional organization already has uh, to do these types of things. And then the last question that was submitted in advance is what protocols are in place around the pandemic? That's a really great question. Um, I, I'm presuming this would uh, pertain more to an in-person event. And I do see that there's, I, I, I take to be kind of a related uh, question in the chat, what might be determining factors in EDUSA deciding of an in-person or virtual? So, you know, as we all know, things are, are shifting quickly with conditions, um, I would say if, if we are planning for an in-person event um, and, and um, our, our most recent host, University of Missouri, Kansas City knows this well, um, since we're planning a few months ahead of time, we try to pick a date by which you know, we, we need to make a decision and what's gonna happen in terms of the, you know, the planning, like a kind of a drop dead date, this is when we're making our decision. Um, and a lot of it is gonna depend on what is the conditions in the, in the host location, um, because you know, we, we certainly follow all the, all the protocols that are in place uh, for a given location. And so um, I, I, we probably, if it's, if it's still up in the air, and you know, I know frankly, no one knows what 2022 will bring, um, we, would, uh, you know, we would just take it as we go. Um, but it's really hard to say, but I mean, we're definitely, uh, going to be respectful of all the, the local regulations. Um, and, you know, we do have, we do have the virtual and it, we've had, I, I would say that, um, you know, we've been able to achieve just about every aspect of, of the components of a seminar virtually. I mean, there, I think there's pros and cons with in-person and virtual. Um, so um, that would be my answer. I mean, we really hope, like I said, to get back to in-person in 2022. But now that we've had this experience with virtual, you know, I, I think we might we might keep some of that. We will keep some of that if you know, depending on conditions moving forward. So, um, yeah, I know you all are, are more than familiar <laughs> with these tough decisions. Okay, so let's see here. Um, next question: 
do many REACTs attend a seminar or is it staff from mostly U.S. universities that sign up? So the audience are U.S. institutions and other higher education professionals. So I would say the bulk of the attendees are from our, our higher education institution-based um, staff or uh, staff. Um, so in terms of REACTs, um, there are two that we uh, select per seminar and they deliver the content usually in at least two sessions. So we try to highlight um, the REACTs and the regions that they happen to be from uh, for at least one session and then they may collaborate on another session. If it's in person, they will travel and come to the event. Um, but we've, we've only had, we've had two and, and that has seemed to work pretty well. So hopefully I answered that thoroughly. Um, let's see, has a hybrid model in person with some virtual panels been contemplated? Um, we haven't had the opportunity to get that far because we haven't been able to go back to in person just yet since the pandemic. But certainly, you know, we're open to lots of uh, innovative ideas, as I said. And so um, the hybrid model is something I think we would consider. And of course, it would it would go back to the capabilities of the host uh, to be able to do that. But certainly we're we're um, we're learning as we go, just like all of you. So so I would say, yes, we're open to models like that moving forward. Um, let's see, we have about five more minutes. Um, I'm seeing if I missed any in the chat. You're also welcome to unmute and ask a question if you like as well, or ask Stacy or Brian a question, please feel free. Okay, I see another question here. Um, I know the focus of EDUSA is higher education, but can we invite speakers or attendees from high schools or now agents as a presentation? That's a great question. So you're correct. Our focus is on higher education. Um, in terms of just the speakers and content in general, um, that would be a conversation that's between the host and us. We haven't, uh, we haven't done that. We have had agents. So our the EDUSA policy on work on interacting and engaging with agents is that um, we will um, include agents as long as they officially represent at least one accredited U.S. higher education institution. Um, so normally that is the case. Um, so absolutely, you know, that is that is something that we do. Um, we don't typically work with the secondary school uh, counselors or population, but again, I mean, this is each seminar is a bit unique. We have those two themes that I mentioned, um, but we do try to uh, put forward timely and engaging content. So um, I would say that we would discuss it and go from there. I mean, if you have you know, ideas that you think fill a, a void or especially ones that are pertinent to your region or your area, that's certainly something that we would wanna talk about with you. Can, can I comment on that actually, Rebecca? Please. For a second. Please um, we actually had a panel in our live one that was uh, speakers from national professional organizations. So we had representatives from ACRO, AIRC, which is that's agents. And we also had NACAC and NAFSA. So we had these professional organizations that talked about what it means to work with an agent. So, so that was something that we incorporated into ours. And also we have high school members of Study Alabama that came. So the high schools can come, they did come to ours. So um, it may not have been something that EDUSA was necessarily aware of, but we had some uh, that came. So, cause some of them, we have some um, boarding schools in Alabama that are members of our consortium that did attend, so. Okay, excellent point. Great. And, you know, if the host is, if, if it's uh, someone that they work with, then, you know, that's that's totally something that, that we would want to consider and talk about because that's something perhaps unique that they're bringing to this particular uh, event. Okay. Um, I see another question here. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, what is the expectation around the length of the seminar? How many individual sessions are usually included? That's a really good question. And I encourage you to go to the website and see an example. Um, and I believe Boise State's webpage is still active, which we're really appreciative of. <laughs> it gives us something good to, to, um, to reference. 
Um, so it has been designed as a one day seminar and one day has typically been um, for an in-person, it would start off probably eight or 9 a.m. and go maybe until 3 p.m. It's a little bit different for in-person because we have to think about people physically coming to a location and, and rush hour and things like that. Um, and so usually that we find that's what works best. Our, um, we have had about five sessions uh, for the virtual, they were 45 minutes with some short buffer time in between, and then also an opening and a closing. For the virtual, it's a little bit different. It's again one day, which is our goal, but because we realize that we're going to have people attending from you know, different time zones across the U.S., we really have to start a little bit later uh, if we're going to accommodate, and we go by the time of the host and where they're located. So, um, you know, when, when Boise State hosted, they're on mountain time, which is two hours behind uh, Eastern time where, where we sit in Washington, D.C. And so we had the day on mountain time. So it started, you know, late morning for us, but it was in the morning for Brian and his colleagues. And then, you know, we ended by, I think it was 4 or 4.30. Um, so that was into early evening for us, but it was, uh, you know, the end of the work day for Boise State. Um, so it is a full day, uh, you know, I, I don't know, Stacey, how many sessions were there at, at your event? Do you remember? <laughs> I was just looking at that. We had six, six like lectury talks. Uh -huh. We had a lunch with like a general talk and we had speed dating at the oh, end okay. of the day with the reacts and the organizational representatives, which was okay. very popular. So, <laughs> so I would say roughly six hours in both cases, but the timing's going to shift a little bit because of yeah, the some things format. were only 30 minutes. I mean, it just yeah. depended what the topic was. Okay. Well, these are great questions. I so appreciate the interest of you all and your attendance, a special thanks to Stacy and Brian for coming in and sharing their expertise. And now I'm really excited to turn it over to Susanna, who's going to talk about hosting advisors. Um, so I hope you can stay. Um, and thank you again for your interest in the seminar hosting.